I uh, am from the NIH, and there I head a center called the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. It's a complex and interesting job. We're actually what, the smallest center at the NIH. Our uh, budget is only 0.4% of the total NIH budget. But we have responsibility for an enormous range of health practices, all those kinds of things people do to promote their health that are not part of, of mainstream health care. And that's been a, a challenge over the years. In fact, our existence has been somewhat controversial. Uh, physicians and healthcare providers are pretty conservative, and a lot of them have thought we should keep all the money going into conventional um, modes of care. We've supported over the years a largish number of very rigorous, careful trials of dietary supplements. Uh, most of them actually have not had the benefit we hoped for. And in the six years since I have uh, run the center, we've refocused in many ways uh, on mind and body practices such as meditation. Uh, and we're particularly focusing currently on pain management. So uh, today I'm going to tell you a few highlights of that, wor of that work. And I decided in this uh, conversation of sages and scientists to be very concrete and take a couple examples uh, of work on mindfulness and meditation and dig into those in a little depth so you'd get a little more uh, sense of the kind of scientific uh, approach that the research that we fund uh, is undertaking. Here's a definition of mindfulness. Uh, there are probably several out there, uh, but uh, John Kabat-Zinn, who uh, is one of the leaders in the application of mindfulness to healthcare, uh, call, uses these words, paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in a present moment, and non-judgmentally. Uh, Kabat-Zinn, like, like Deepak, has been one of the pioneers of mindfulness approaches in a setting of, of healthcare. And uh, we've become very intrigued at these approaches. They're very well described, they're very concrete, and they're the kind of thing scientists can put uh, their uh, arms around and study. And so we are the main place at the NIH where this kind of research is currently uh, supported. Um, we've heard a lot of conversations today about mind and body. And uh, the, this is an old uh, notion back to Descartes that these uh, two uh, uh, regions of our experience have to be kept uh, separate. You heard a lot of conversation this morning about experiences in the mind that may be hard uh, to root in the biology of the brain. But coming from a scientific perspective, as I do, uh, I guess my concept of the mind is pretty strongly footed in the biology of our brains. Uh, although I don't feel I have the uh, knowledge and, uh, in that enables me to comment very uh, thoughtfully on this uh, very interesting conversation you heard this morning. But what I can say is that this mind-body duality and the notion that things of the mind are not biologically based is often causing some real mischief in healthcare settings. That patients who come to doctors uh, and uh, physicians who dismiss the problems of mental illness or of severe unmanageable symptoms as being in the mind uh, can be very problematic for patients and doctors. So one of the things that's really happening right now in, the sci in science is a real exploration of activities of the mind and how those are rooted in the activities in the biology of the brain. Now, with meditation, we've known for quite a while that meditative states result in different brain waves. Uh, and uh, that was been referred to this morning, and I think in the short, uh, very sweet meditation that Deepak led us through this morning, uh, probably it at least began to influence some of our brain waves. 
But there's some more uh, going on on the work on what meditation uh, does to the brain. And I think over the next uh, few years, we're really going to get a better sense of how regular uh, practice of meditation may truly change uh, brain circuitry. But before we get to that, I'm going to do a digression and tell you about an experiment, uh, a study that um, deals with how the wandering mind uh, and its effects. Um, mind wandering is a common uh, concept. And uh, I, as an a almost 70-year-old, I about five years ago, I decided I wanted to be able to run a, a marathon. So I started regular want running. Now, I still haven't run a marathon, but I've run a number of half marathons. And I spend a fair amount of time every week uh, running, and I love it. I ran this morning beside the Pacific. It was beautiful. Uh, and one of the things I've come to feel about that mind, uh, about the regular running, is it's a wonderful opportunity for mind wandering. It's part of what I love about running. So when I began, but more recently, as part of my responsibilities for meditation, I've also taken up some regular meditative practice. And one of the things you will encounter regularly in any meditative experience is a, a training in stopping mind wandering. Here's a quote from Tara Brack, whose uh, meditative classes I occasionally attend. And when you notice that your mind has wandered from the present, and it will, pause and gently, non-judgmentally, escort your attention back. And this uh, experience of meditating, of trying to sit for longish periods and not allow the mind to wander, has been a pretty active struggle for me, as it is for most beginning meditators. So that's prompted me to think about mind wandering. Uh, here are a few quotes. Well, this is uh, from William James, who in invented the term stream of consciousness. But he talks about the stream of consciousness as being the essence of our subjective lives. Here's another quote from E.O. Wilson, a wonderful naturalist. Adults forget the depths of lang languor into which the adolescent mind descends. Not uh, Jack and Drake, but uh, most adolescent minds. They are prone to undervalue the mental growth that occurs during daydreaming and aimless wandering. Even the Beatles signed in as being pro-mind wandering. I'm fixing a hole where the rain gets in and stops my mind from wandering. Where will it go? Where will it go? That's something those of us from the, who, from, who are from the 60s uh, remember. So here's a study that I think is kind of interesting that deals with mind wandering. Uh, this was uh, done by a set of uh, investigators, Killingham and Gilbert, who developed a, an app to uh, track your happiness. If you Google track your happiness, you will uh, pull up uh, this app and you can download it on your, uh, on your phone. And if you sign up for this program, you will be prompted several times a day to report on how happy you are, on what you're actually doing, and whether your mind is wandering. And here are some of the results. And the core finding of Killingsworth and Gilbert is that a wandering mind is an unhappy mind, at least some of the time. So here's the mean happiness reported during each activity. Uh, this is on a scale from uh, 0 to 100, but the average uh, level of happiness reported was around 65. And uh, most things clustered right around that middle. The only thing that moved off to the left uh, with almost 95% happiness was that little dot for making love. And you'll notice that exercising uh, was also uh, people were reporting a more mean happiness. This, uh, these reports are, this study is for uh, something we heard about a fair amount this uh, last yesterday, it is an example of uh, big data. This is uh, averages of half a million responses from th three or 4,000 people. 
And here's what they found about mind wandering. Now, about half the time, people's minds were not wandering, but a little more than half the time, they were wandering. And the sum of all those mind wandering dots is actually somewhat more negative. Uh, the pleasant mind wandering had a slight had similar happiness to not mind-wandering, but both neutral and unpleasant mind-wandering uh, was associated with lower levels of, of happiness. So it's an interesting study, I think, perhaps not the definitive answer to a complicated question, but an interesting example of how science and big data is enabling investigators to take on questions that uh, in the past might be seen as, as unmeasurable. Okay, now I'm going to uh, switch and, and talk uh, briefly uh, about an experiment that deals with uh, meditation and the brain. And this experiment focuses on pain. Pain management has become a very important area of focus for us at the NIH and for the center that I head. Uh, we are uh, supporting a largest body of research, about 40% of what we fund, uh, focuses on how alternative treatments can ease uh, pain. In, and the reason for this uh, sense of urgency about this problem is the data that is telling us that prescription drugs are not a good treatment for pain. Opioid death rate has gone up strikingly over the last decade as opioids have been prescri prescribed uh, more and more uh, without real uh, clear uh, benefits for chronic pain. And we are learning that the mind-body approaches are really an essential part of pain management. So an important mission for our center is building the kind of evidence that will help a conservative healthcare system figure out how to uh, incorporate these practices into the care of patients with chronic pain. The Department of Defense and the VA are actually leading the way with substantially uh, in uh, stronger programs on pain management. Uh, this is a report from the Office of the Army Surgeon General, uh, which recommended inclusion of mind-body practices into pain management. Uh, the study I'm going to tell you about uses fMRI. You've heard about that at several points at this meeting before. Uh, here's a picture of a person going into an fMRI uh, machine, and this is uh, the title of the uh, study I'm going to show you. Uh, in this investigation, Dr. Lutz and uh, in the uh, group of Richard Davidson looked at the effect of uh, uh, an experimental pain measured in the MRI machine uh, using both novice meditators who'd gone through an eight-week course on meditation and expert meditators who had practiced for many years. And the way this experiment was done is that in the time the person was in the fMRI machine, they were asked to begin a meditative experience and then exposed to an experimental pain that was either a mild, warm heating pad on their foot or a uh, temperature dr driven up to about 48 degrees, which is experienced by uh, people as unpleasant. The uh, experts and the novices did not differ at all, really significantly, in the intensity with which they experienced the pain. But the experts, uh, the expert meditators with years of experience at meditation, uh, did not experience this as, as unpleasant. And when the actual images were uh, examined for what regions of the brain were activated, the differences were very striking. The meditators actually were, had the region of the brain that senses pain, and that's shown by that red line, uh, were more sensitive. But the regions of the brain that process uh, pain as uh, unpleasant, the amygdala and the anterior insula were less activated. These are very striking 
uh, large uh, differences. And again, that's an arrow to the amygdala. The amygdala is increasingly a center in the brain that is identified as uh, important for fear and negative uh, responses. So this is the kind of work that is telling us how long experience with meditative practice may actually change not just temporarily brain waves, but in a very fundamental way, uh, brain circuits. This is the kind of uh, work that's being done to, to explore uh, brain circuits. My colleague, uh, Dr. Inzel, uh, will talk more about the potential of these uh, methods somewhat later. In this session, uh, Tom has really been a leader at the NIH in, in work that will uh, help us understand and break down that mind-body paradigm, which in the thinking about mental illness has been uh, so uh, troublesome. So just a couple parting thoughts. Uh, I'd be interested in hearing from Deepak and others what are important questions. How can the research on meditation uh, move us forward? And I would say that the perspective of healthcare systems and policymakers, uh, the perspective of clinical practitioners, the perspective of the individuals uh, may be uh, different, uh, but all three uh, perspectives are, are important. So thank you for your attention. Sure. Dr. Briggs. Do Dr. Briggs, about a decade ago, I remember doing a story at CNN, at CNN on how revolutionary it was because some of, and very few, I want to say a couple, uh, top medical schools were incorporating mind-body practices into their medical schools. And there was lots of controversy. Oh, why is that hocus pocus in here? And you know, we, we are serious medical doctors. Right. Okay, let's fast forward with what you just talked about, what Deepak talks about, what a lot of the doctors here have been talking about. How far have we come or have we not come far enough mm -hmm. with regard to implementing mind-body practices in our top medical schools, right? So doctors come out thinking, don't always have to prescribe pill after pill after pill. Yeah. I'm actually going to prescribe <laughs> meditation and watch what happens. Well, this is a, a very conservative ecosystem. We, we now have 40 medical schools that have some kind of program of what's been called integrative medicine, which generally means approaches that take and build uh, mind-body practices, uh, and more attention to diet, more attention uh, to, to uh, the whole person into care. And we do fi have many physicians who have really embraced this approach, but it's a, it's a debate still within the medical profession. Uh, we uh, have chosen to focus on pain because it is so clear, I think, to every sensible doc that we're doing a lousy job with pain management a and the need for uh, the patient truly having skills that will allow them a p control of their emotional state uh, mm -hmm. in facing chronic pain. It's not that we think that pills won't be part of pain management, but the whole notion that integrative pain clinics have is that there ne is, needs to be uh, a combined approach that brings some of the mental skills uh, and, uh, in fact, practical techniques, chiropractic care, massage care, into the management of chronic pain. Mm -hmm. So we've started, but there's a long way to go. Dr. Deepak. Dr. If, if, if I could also ask a, a question. You know, I, I, listening to Eric Topol last night talk about not using a stethoscope in, in, in four years and going through a whole range of physician practices that are just simply out of date and antiquated. Right. And it make, made me, you know, recall the old days, you know, when George Washington was bled for a fever and things right. like this. How, I mean, just, and, and listening to you, it's very much in the same arena. How much of the medical profession are, are do, do you see as just akin to that, that we're bloodletting, that, that we are uh, so antiquated in the way in which doctors are dealing with people today? Um, because it's sort of scary. <laughs> so there seem to yeah. be clearly people in the audience who agree with you. I, I think it very much depends on different health domains. I'm a kidney doctor, and I've taken care of dialysis patients, uh, transplant patients, and 
we do very much prolong people's lives with these life-saving technologies. Uh, so there's no doubt that in certain arenas, modern medicine is doing wonderful and important things. Uh, we're really, I think, not very good uh, at some things like symptom management. And of course, symptom management uh, is the main reason people go to doctors. And we're frankly terrible. Mm. at figuring out how to motivate people to lead healthier lives. Mm. Uh, and uh, so um, building a kind of range of approaches into our healthcare uh, and fighting the natural conservatism of, of the systems and the real um, uh, uncertainty about how reimbursement policy should evolve mm -hmm. is part of the reason we need effectiveness work in, in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Briggs, for coming here, taking the time from mm -hmm. your busy schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think all of us, you, me, and Tom, took our training around the same time right. in internal medicine. And so I remember a day uh, when I was chief resident at the Boston VA, and I got up in the middle of the night to go you know, to the restroom, and I saw my nurse waking a patient up. Mr. Jones, will you please wake up? I have to give you your sleeping pill. <laughs> so, you know, I paused and I went to her. I said, you're waking him up to giving a sleeping pill? And she said, yes, because I know he's going to wake up. And when he wakes up, he's going to wake me up, and I'm going to wake you up. <laughs> so I said, OK, go ahead then. You know? and, but since then, and I don't know if our audience knows this data, but you know, there's a program in New York called uh, Urban Zen, mm -hmm. and that was initiated by Donna Karen. And the urban Zen people go to the local hospitals in New York, and they teach patients with chronic illness uh, who are quite moribund three or four things. Number one, they teach them to meditate, sitting mm -hmm. up in bed. Right. They teach them a few breathing and yoga exercises in bed, mm -hmm. sitting up in bed. And they teach them massage, and we'll see how all that relates to the microbiome and all, all that. And what they found is that most of the prescriptions in a hospital are for the following things, pain, anxiety, Sleep. nausea, insomnia, and constipation. The acronym for that is PANIC. Pain, <laughs> anxiety, nausea, insomnia, and constipation. That's 80% of the prescriptions in a hospital. Now, if we did away with that, that's a huge industry, by the way. And there are 28 lobbyists in Congress, healthcare lobbyists, for every right. single congressman. Yeah. So the battle is not only creating this literature and science, the battle is also, if I call it a battle, you don't actually win a battle by attacking anyone, but you make the old, old model obsolete. And I think that's what we are doing right now, right. making the old model obsolete. Mm -hmm. the, the average patient in a nursing home on a given day takes 10 different pharmaceuticals. Uh, most people uh, in the nursing home need, age probably need two. And the others are, are the, the panic meds. And, and uh, of course, uh, opioids for older people are, as chronic pain management are terrible. They result in constipation for sure, uh, falls, and, um, and really, in fact, often ineffectual pain management. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Thank you. A very rigorous, careful trials of dietary supplements. Uh, most of them actually have not had the benefit we hoped for. And in the six years since I have uh, run the center. We've refocused in many ways uh, on mind and body practices such as meditation. Uh, and we're particularly focusing currently on pain management. So uh, today I'm going to tell you a few highlights of that, wor of that work. And I decided in 
this uh, conversation of sages and scientists to be very concrete and take a couple examples uh, of work on mindfulness and meditation and dig into those in a little depth so you'd get a little more uh, sense of the kind of scientific uh, approach that the research that we fund uh, is undertaking. Here's a... De I uh, am from the NIH, and there I head a center called the National Center for Complementary and Alternative Medicine. It's a complex and interesting job. We're actually what, the smallest center at the NIH. Our uh, budget is only 0.4% of the total NIH budget. But we have responsibility for an enormous range of health practices, all those kinds of things people do to promote their health that are not part of, of mainstream health care. And that's been a, a challenge over the years. In fact, our existence has been somewhat controversial. Uh, physicians and healthcare providers are pretty conservative, and a lot of them have thought we should keep all the money going into conventional um, modes of care. We've supported over the years a largish number. Definition of mindfulness, uh, there's probably several out there, uh, but. Uh, John Kabat-Zinn, who uh, is one of the leaders in the application of mindfulness to healthcare, uh, call, uses these words, paying attention in a particular way, on purpose, in a present moment, and non-judgmentally. Uh, Kabat-Zinn, like, like Deepak, has been one of the pioneers of mindfulness approaches in a setting of, of healthcare. And uh, we've become very intrigued at these approaches. They're very well described, they're very concrete, and they're the kind of things scientists can put uh, their uh, arms around and study. And so we are the main place at the NIH where this kind of research is currently uh, supported. Um, we've heard a lot of conversations today that are not biologically based is often causing some real mischief in healthcare settings. That patients who come to doctors uh, and uh, physicians who dismiss the problems of mental illness or of severe unmanageable symptoms as being in the mind uh, can be very problematic for patients and doctors. So one of the things that's really happening right now in, the sci in science is a real exploration of activities of the mind and how those are rooted in the activities in the biology of the brain. Now, with meditation, we've known for quite a while that meditative states result in different brain waves. Uh, and uh, that was been referred to this morning, and I think in the short, about mind and body. And uh, the, this is an old uh, notion back to Descartes that these uh, two uh, uh, co regions of our experience have to be kept uh, separate. You heard a lot of conversation this morning about experiences in the mind that may be hard uh, to root in the biology of the brain. But coming from a scientific perspective, as I do, uh, I guess my concept of the mind is pretty strongly footed in the biology of our brains. Uh, although I don't feel I have the uh, knowledge and uh, in that enables me to comment very uh, thoughtfully on this uh, very interesting conversation you heard this morning. But what I can say is that this mind-body duality and the notion that things of the mind 